I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so uh, I was invited by uh, Bertrand and Chaz to give the interferometry short course here. Um, and this was an idea to try and bring everybody up to the same page on interferometry concepts. For some of you, this will be very old hat, um, but it is, uh, I think, useful. Um, you know, one of the things about working on interferometry, though, that I have found is that I'm perpetually relearning new things from old material. And so this kind of thing can be very useful. You know, generally speaking, uh, interferometry is to live in a perpetual state of ignorance that you're trying to get over. Most of us, this is why we get married, but uh, this is also a good place to be. So um, we, many years ago, ran a whole series of Michelson summer schools uh, to try and bring up a community to uh, learn about interferometry. And this is actually uh, maybe a topic for discussion later on in terms of community engagement. But uh, we, uh, we found that uh, interferometry by and large to your typical astronomer was this magical, mystical, scary thing. And uh, this was highlighted, I think, when we had one week of interferometry schools when come about Thursday of a week long summer school on the topic, you know, some, some, some student sheepishly raised their hand and they were like, can you tell me what again, what, what's a fringe? And at that point we knew we had to kind of change tactics and be smarter about how we were teaching things. So uh, some of this approach I think has borne out of, uh, of uh, that experience and trying to get it, get it over across to people. Um, I welcome people to correct me if I'm slightly off in some of these concepts, uh, but uh, I'm gonna do my best here. So I'm gonna start off with a very basic scientific concept. Um, I will, by the way, I'm gonna give kind of the broad, almost cartoon level introduction to things, and then we'll have some comments from uh, Chaz and from Gautam talking about how things get even more complicated when you try to take these ideas into actual application on the ground or, or space. So the basic scientific motivation here, though, is that when you increase spatial resolution, you make discoveries. And so you can do that with an eight inch telescope and 10 years of patience, where you can take a dot in the sky and actually turn it into a world. Technically, I'm not allowed to say planet, even though I'm from Lowell Observatory. Uh, we'll fix that someday, but uh, anyway. Um, but what's very interesting about this is how when you go to greater levels of spatial resolution, a single picture can completely change how you think about things, where you see a surface that is younger than you expect, where there's no craters where you expect to see them. And that tells you about glaciation and surface renewal and the dynamics of the outer Kuiper belt on this world, Pluto, that uh, you expected to see more lumping on and more cratering on. And just a single picture can do that. So, in every case, when we've increased spatial resolution from Galileo with his very first telescope, finding that there were worlds orbiting something else in the sky, and that completely broke cosmology for them, to things at now the micro arc second resolution coming out of VLTI gravity and the galactic center, uh, we're really kind of breaking into new physics. So to motivate the very back of the envelope thing, we can try and come up with what sort of spatial resolutions we want to talk about when we're looking at stars. And um, this is something that's actually a very fun back of the envelope exercise for my students. Basically, if you think about the fact that the sun is you know, the size of your thumbnail at arm's length, about 30 arc minutes across, and that it is roughly 10 billion times brighter than the next nearest star, you just basically scale the area that's emitting light and you make the really incorrect but slightly useful assumption here that all stars are exactly like the sun and you can scale down the size and you get to the realization that the next largest star is gonna be on the order of tens of milli arc seconds across. And this is actually not so wrong. Uh, you know, the biggest star out there, Betelgeuse and some other ones like it, are in the order of about 50, five zero milli arc seconds across. And uh, generally speaking, you know, if you're in the three to five milli arc second range, you're talking about giant stars, the big giant stars that make up about 30% of the sky, the 30% of the stars we can see with our eyes outside. And then um, another good chunk of the stars that we can see with our own eyes when you walk outside at night are main sequence stars. And they're kind of in the you know, one milli arc second to maybe a tenth of a milli arc second across in size. And so that gives you a sense of the scale, the optical system you want to build, you want to image their surfaces. 
Uh, when people talk about interferometry, I often get told that this sounds like silver bullet science. I like the analogy because it is kind of magical like silver bullets and it's expensive like silver bullets, but every now and then you have a subject that warrants it. So this is, uh, and this is also another question of ours for uh, the community building thing, which is interferometers are generally speaking, at least as they've been built so far, very bad at making pretty pictures. And the rest of the astronomical community outside of this room is not as evolved as us. <laughs> and they have this need for pretty pictures. And so we need to think about either how to you know, dissuade that pr from them, that, that, that notion, or how to give them that. So that's something to think about down the road. So here we go. We're going to do the crash course in interferometry. Um, and I'm going to try and do this in trying to uh, pull you along. And this is what I do with you know, regular astronomers, is I try to take something they think they understand and turn it into something they think they can't and won't understand, which is interferometry. And what they think they understand is two things. They think they understand telescopes, and they think they understand photometry. The actual truth of it is they don't, but we're just going to start with the assumption that they do and work from there. So a telescope is a big collecting aperture, at least a conventional telescope, is a big collecting aperture, either a lens or in most cases, of course, a mirror, that collects light, concentrates light. Now, there is something very important about how telescopes do this, which is if you were to put all of the rays of light across the face, I'm only showing the extremum here, but if you take all the rays across the face of the aperture and trace them through, what you would find importantly for a diffraction limited telescope is that if you measure the path length through the system at any path that can get from your target to the focal plane on the back end, that path length is going to be equal. It's going to be equal to some tolerance. That's a fraction of the wavelength of light that you're operating at. And every telescope will, will basically satisfy this. Um, it's interesting to kind of take this concept and go places with it as far as think of how X-ray telescopes work with the grazing incidence mirrors and that kind of thing. All of it still works in terms of path lengths are all equal. And this is very important. You want to start with this thought that uh, the path lengths are all equal. Now, What's actually happening here is you have a diffraction phenomenon going on. Since all of these path lengths are equal and all focusing down to the same spot, you actually get diffraction forming your spot on the back end. And this is why a, for a uh, completely diffraction limit telescope where the atmosphere is either being corrected for or not present in the case of a space-based telescope, what you'll find is you get not just a point of light, but you get a spot with the airy rings going around it because that's diffraction. That's a diffraction effect. The secret sauce here that every astronomer needs to realize is that all telescopes are interferometers. Every telescope is working and giving you this diffraction limited spot because of interference. And that's, that's an important place to start. Now, if you have one of these traditional telescopes, you also can make your pretty pictures that the astronomers want. And you can do this because not only are the on-axis rays satisfying this path length condition as you go through the telescope, but slightly off-axis, this is happening too. Now, this puts a engineering demand on what you've built. This means that the shape of this primary mirror, which generally is described by some math, needs to actually be matched by an equal shape over here. Well, not really equal, but a matching shape over here, also described by some math such that these rays that you can trace through here for both on axis and off axis have equal path length to the focal plane on the back end. What's interesting about that is that leads you actually, if you really get into the weeds of this, to a whole family of telescopes you can build based on different shapes. You can build a Dahl Kirkham, you can build a Ritchie Cretan, you can build these things where if you have a certain shape here, if it's a hy hyperbola or an ellipse or a spherical mirror, you can actually then come up with the matching secondary such that for most cases, you can draw through here to within your optical tolerance and get a nice image out of the back end. And so uh, for a hyperbolic mirror, in the case of uh, Richie Creighton, you need, a, I think, a parabolic mirror here. I think I've got them mixed up actually, but um, the Dahl Kirkham is an interesting case where you end up with a spherical secondary and that has actually certain manufacturing simplifications. That's why 
a number of, of uh, corporations right now that build amateur telescopes, build Dahl Kirkhams because it makes the secondary very easy to build with a spherical shape. And so uh, you can come up with all these sorts of things that match this path length condition so that you get the image in the back end. And so here is where we're going to start marching off into the weeds and come up with an interesting story here. Now, as long as you're making that path length condition satisfied, you can build your telescope in a number of different ways. If you want to make a really big telescope, you can actually build your primary out of individual pieces and put them all together as long as you get this overall shape still such that the path length through the system is the same. And we all know that this is done in astronomy with places like Keck and soon to be the ELTs that are coming up. Um, you know, these, these telescopes all work because the path lengths through it are equal. And as long as you're doing that, you're going to get a diffraction limited spot in the back end. I actually went out and found a nice diffraction limited Keck image here. You get kind of a hexagonal sort of PSF because of the outer boundaries of that particular aperture. But what's going on here is you're still getting a diffraction limited spot on the back end. To make an interferometer, we just take this idea and run with it. And the simple first thing you can do is actually delete many of the segments and still get an image on the back end. Uh, actually, early, I think the early uh, demonstration with Keck used a subset of the total 36 segments, and it would work because they were matching the, uh, the diffraction limited condition. They had, they had the overall shape of the primary correct with the segments they did have in. And this is also why Keck still works when a segment of a given shape is, uh, of a given part of the aperture is offline as well, which happens on rare occasions, I think. Um, so you can make the diameter very big, uh, or you can make your telescope less expensive because you're deleting parts of it that you can't afford. Um, where we go with interferometry is, is all we do is we take it one step further, and rather than have a single big aperture that's sparse, we have individual apertures that are being collectors and setting it to the back end. And again, as long as you are uh, ma matching this condition of the path length through the system here is the same as the path length through the system here, um, to a fraction of the wavelength of light that you're operating at, you will get a diffraction limited system and you will have a working optical imager. Um, one caveat here is that we're starting to make our soda straw that we're looking through increasingly long and increasingly narrow and so we're starting to sacrifice field of view. Um, one of the things that's going on here is that, you know, we're talking about, uh, we talked about earlier on about off-axis rays trying to get through, and we're very rapidly getting to, into a condition where only stuff very nearly on-axis or on-axis is going to get through. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, now, you can make these optical systems actually very big by starting to space these apertures further and further apart. And uh, that lets you ba basically get to very, very high amounts of resolution. But you're also starting to get to a point where making the path length through each side of your system exactly equal just kind of from the starting point, it makes it very hard to do. And so we start to introduce these things called delay lines, where you can actually take light and send it through these systems that trombone in and out and uh, you can actually control the path length this way. And this actually uh, lets us do useful things like deal with the fact that the telescopes may have unequal spacing or the apparent spacing of the telescopes is changing because you're on a rotating Earth, let's say. In fact, here's what this looks like here. This actually is a little animation which is not going to start on me, but it'll at least try. Ah, too bad. This actually shows one of the VLTI auxiliary telescopes being driven around the site here. And so what you can do is you can take a telescope and change its relative position to the back end. So we've moved this one way over here, and we just basically pull the delay line in so that the overall distance is uh, roughly equal between them. Um, these things give you a lot of control, and um, they allow you some flexibility in the relative spacing of the telescopes, and we'll get back to why that's important. Um, what's also important is that, uh, for at least the ground-based case, you may have a situation where you're looking at a source that's very far away and the light traveling to it, that's part of your optical system is the distance traveled outside the telescope as well as inside the telescope. That distance may be to your optical system 
uh, equal at a certain point, but then as the Earth rotates, it is going to, the light will get to one of the telescopes much sooner than it gets to one of the other telescopes. And so you have these delay lines that allow you to compensate for that with the rotation of the Earth. In the case of uh, these optical systems on the ground, when you have a spacing of about 100 meters, that translates into a motion of your delay lines of you know, about a centimeter a second. And uh, so you have to actually have to move mirrors on rails uh, at that rate. But keep in mind that while you're moving those mirrors on rails at that rate, you still have to be matching the optical tolerance of you know, some fraction of a wavelength of light. You know, in the case of optical light, maybe about 10 nanometers is your target here. And so you're moving at centimeters per second, but having to hit tolerances of 10 nanometers. And so you need servos that have extremely high dynamic range. And the uh, invention and development of that was really first accomplished uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And that's what led to the first on-sky optical interferometers. Uh, that's actually, the, the, these systems are really at the heart of making uh, these kinds of telescopes work. So what does an interferometer actually see when you put light through the system? So I've deliberately drawn a system with two telescopes with one of the arms uh, of unequal path length, where we're traveling much further through this A side arm than the B side arm. And so in this case, we have a system that is not phased, a system where uh, the light is being combined from the two sides, but incoherently on what is just basically a single element uh, photo detector. And so all you get is the incoherent contribution of telescope A and telescope B, you get a signal that's basically double the amount of these equally sized telescopes showing up on the back end. Now, if you pull this delay line into the right position so that the offset is no longer something uh, different between the two, but closer to equal, what you get is fringes. And all that is, is the constructive and destructive interference of light. All it is is that you are seeing photometry that is fluctuating in amplitude. And this is what it looks like, is you get constructive, destructive interference of light. That's because this is a diffraction limited optical system at this point. Um, an important point is that uh, in this kind of system that I believe I've drawn is almost all reflective. I guess I have one transmissive element here, but basically you get this in white light. Uh, you get this signal in uh, the way, all the wavelengths of light that are being sent to the back end. So, this is happening with the blue and the red light, um, and this is one of the reasons why you have a fringe envelope, uh, is that uh, the light is uh, at zero offset is where you get all the wavelengths of light matching up and interfering properly. Now, if we apply this to observing, small, to, to observing stars, uh, what you get is for a very, very small star, you know, in the case of say a uh, interferometer that has 100-ish or 300-ish meters baselines, if you have a star that's less than about a quarter of a milliarc second in size, what you'll see is nice sharp fringes. You'll get very, very high amplitude on these fringes from the constructive and the destructive interference. But when you start to go to larger and larger stars, what you'll find is that the amplitude of these fringes actually starts to reduce. And so what's actually happening here is the left side and the right side of the star are actually starting to have slightly different path lengths through the optical system. And that means the optical system is beginning to resolve the target that you're interested in. And so the zero point of the light from the left side and from the right side of these systems is actually shifting away from each other and actually becoming uh, discernible in your optical system. But your single element photo detector that I've drawn here is still getting all that light mashed together on the back end. And so you're starting to get the constructive interference of light washed out with just in, incoherent uh, contributions. And as a result, the overall amplitude of these fringes goes down. This is useful. Uh, in the simplest application that we've done for many decades in the field of observational interferometry, we've measured the amplitude of these fringes and use that to directly measure the sizes of stars. And uh, uh, that's actually pretty bread and butter astrophysics. This size measurement allows us to, uh, with the distances to the stars, measure the linear radius of the star. So this is only giving you the angular size of the star. Uh, 
Um, you can also combine this information if you're able to measure the bolometric flux of the star, you're able to directly measure the temperature of the stars. And so there's been a lot of work done over the years with fundamental measurement of, uh, of uh, fundamental stellar parameters with this kind of thing. So again, with a small star, the left and the right side actually are not separated, but if it's such, if it's a if it's a point-like star relative to the overall architecture of the of, of the uh, interferometer, and so the fringes still line up. They all uh, end up being at zero offset. They all end up being right on the same spot, and so when all that light mashes together, you still get very very sharp fringes. Um, an interesting consequence of this is that if you think back to our resolve case, if you make this star even bigger, if you ramp it up in size. You will soon get to a case where this is just a flat line, or more realistically, it's a line that's, a, you, you know, if you think of any kind of noise level that you actually throw on top of this in the case of a real measurement, you're going to get to a case where it's effectively a flat line. You can't measure the size. And so you rapidly jump into a case where you over-resolve large sources. And uh, that leads us to Mazurkiewicz's law which I like to, like to quote here uh, from Dave Mazurkiewicz, a colleague of mine over at the Navy, Naval Precision Optical Interferometer. Um, there are the fringes you can measure, and there are the fringes that are interesting, and the intersection of the two are, can be a very, very thin slice of what's going on. And uh, his corollary to this is, you know, determine what it is that you can measure and declare it as therefore interesting. So this is, in fact, a game we've done in interferometry for a long time, is we've figured out what stars it is that we can look at, and we've basically established and uh, asserted without proof that these are the interesting things to look at. Um, what's been fun about this is, you know, I think a uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a tangential offshoot from this is that as we build interferometers that are more capable, or at least more directed to the science case that we want, this becomes less of a straitjacket. We can actually determine the things that we want to look at and uh, determine that from the standpoint of, you know, we're interested in them and make the system that matches that rather than have our science targets dictated to us by the optical systems that get built. Here's what a fringe actually looks like for real in life. We, uh, uh, when I was working down at the IOTA interferometer as a wee grad graduate student a few years ago, uh, we had the output from a, a single element INSBE detector being run into uh, an A to D converter, but we also ran it through an oscilloscope. I promise you this was actually not a, just a function generator we hooked up to the scope, but this is the real thing. It is actually the, uh, probably about the 10th picture I took because a lot of these things uh, did not look as nice as this. Uh, but it, it does a good illustration of what you see out of the interferometer as far as the photometry. This was basically sweeping across the screen many times a second uh, as we sampled this, this uh, photo detector very quickly. And uh, from some zero point, uh, we measured the destructive and then the, in, the uh, constructive interference of light. Uh, since we were looking through a filter with a certain band pass to it, we got this fringe envelope. If we had a much, much more narrow uh, uh, filter that we were looking through, this fringe envelope would be much, much wider. Uh, or consequently, if we had a wider band pass, this would even be more narrow. Uh, it highlights a few things like, say, noise. If the object we looked at was even more resolved and only had fringes that were about the size of the noise pattern here, we wouldn't have seen anything. And so that uh, illustrates, I think, the over-resolution case. And um, I'm trying to think of what else is nice and instructive about this. Uh, you have to, you know, calibration is very important because this zero point you have to establish and that sometimes can be hard to do. But uh, this is what it can actually look like in a very, very simple case here. Now, we know that interferometric arrays have been around for a long time in the radio. Um, those people have it too easy. Um, but basically, uh, it's the same idea where you have telescopes, individual antennas here, and they match path lengths, but one of the things that they have going on is uh, they can collect the light, they can detect the light, and then after the fact, at their leisure, they can mix it together. And in contrast to that, in the optical or 
you know, it's debatable in the mid-infrared if, it's, if uh, you have to go either way. Uh, in the past, uh, approaches in the mid-infrared that have done it in a radio-like fashion have suffered badly because of noise. Uh, but it, definitely in the optical, um, uh, at least up until uh, the present day with the current technology we have, we have to collect the light, then very, very carefully put it back together with this path length man matching I'm talking about. And then we have to, at that point, detect the light and we get a signal. Um, probably the shortest wavelength experiment that actually tried to take these radio techniques down uh, to a shorter wavelength was the uh, Berkeley Infrared Stellar Interferometer at about 10 microns. Uh, it was led by Charlie Towns. Uh, Charlie, as we know, got the Nobel Prize for the invention of the laser, mildly contentious award, but uh, he got that nonetheless. His remark on this state of affairs is that uh, he said that it's the value, it's because the value of H bar is what it is, the reason for the difference here. And this tells me a very fundamental thing, which is uh, this is why Charlie got the Nobels, because he actually understands that statement. Um, but no amplifiers is what it boils down to. Um, maybe another way of putting it is um, the, the speed of, of detectors as well just is not fast enough to sample things uh, in the optical as well. Um, I've talked about path length matching, and uh, here's what it actually looks like in one particular example, uh, the Keck interferometer, may it rest in peace. Uh, we had provisions for 16 of these delay lines where we would send light in and be able to bounce it around and have light come out. Uh, I'll note a couple of things of this design. Uh, we have a cat's eye right here. Uh, cat's eye is useful from the standpoint of you have a parabolic mirror reflecting light to a flat back to the parabolic mirror and then it comes out. Uh, with a cat's eye, if you have hills and valleys in your very, very straight rails, Thompson precision rail that you want as straight as possible, but it's never quite perfect, um, you actually can tolerate a bit of that because what you'll get is the beam coming in versus the beam going out. You'll get shear from the two beams but you won't get so much deviation in the direction of the beam. And so you can always catch it on the back end uh, with a bit of pupil mismatch. Um, this also gives you a very, very small optical element that you can actually mount on a piezoelectric stack. And this lets you control it to a very high degree of uh, positional accuracy because the piezo stack has about 100 of microns of throw, but depending on how you condition the voltage, you can actually very easily get it down to about one nanometer positioning accuracy. And so you can position where this particular optical element is very, very well and control the path length through this to a high degree of precision. Now, 100 microns of throw isn't quite enough. You need actually many, many tens of meters of, of optical travel to make this very effective. And so there are stages that come after this. When this runs out of Movement, uh, movement range, the optical part of this cart is actually mounted to the base by means of an inverted pendulum, which is controlled with a voice coil. There's a voice coil right back here. You can see here's a flex pivot and a flex pivot, one there, one there. And so you can swivel this thing back and forth. And so you have about a centimeter of range at that point. So when this runs out of range, you just offload to the next servo. That also runs out of range at some point. And so the optics cart itself, this base is coupled to a motor cart here in the back end by means of a second voice coil, which also has a centimeter or two of range. And so you can offload from voice coil one to voice coil two. And then there's a motor cart separate from the optics cart which has a stepper motor. You can see that right here next to our colleague, Andrew. And um, that stepper motor has the ability to send this whole contraption up and down the rails. And so that gives you many tens of meters of range. Um, each one of these servos, as you go from the piezo to the voice coil one to voice coil two to the stepper motor, um, is, this inner, uh, is this trade space of range versus control and what you do end up with is the ability to have nanometer level control of this mirror, but then tens of meters of throw with this motor. And so this is 
The thing that has made many interferometers work, in fact, this design, uh, this JPL Heritage delay line, went into the Mark III, Palomar interferometer, the Keck interferometer, it's up working at the Chara interferometer, it's working at the Enpoi interferometer. It's actually all the same family of, of technology down to almost the part number level. That's kind of interesting. Um, I have a slide here. Actually, let me do a little bit of magic here and see if I can show you how all this stuff will fly around. Here we go. I stole this from a Vimeo uh, video right here. There you go. So we have a lot of things that went into making the Keck interferometer move. It's a nice video you can find in Vimeo that's much, much longer, but those were a few of the elements that actually went into driving things around here. Uh, I lost where, the, oh, there's actually more going on here. Keck was a lot of fun to work on because you have things at tens of meters of scale, but they're, and you're also controlling things at nanometer levels, and uh, we somehow got it all to work. All right, that's, you can go shop, uh, shop around on the internet and find that. Let's go to the next slide. Here we are. So those are just the very basics of running things. And now we can actually go from that springboard and come up with even more uh, complicated ideas. Um, and so uh, the basics of what I've just shown you are what go into making a, a imaging interferometer work. Basically an interferometer to work as you would think of a regular telescope as working and making pictures. Now, uh, there are things you can throw on top of that that are uh, variations that are either uh, advantageous to use because of working from the Earth's surface or working with other complicated things or the sort of targets you're looking at. Uh, one of the things that um, is a good example is differential phase. Um, we, um, it's also been referred to as wavelength bootstrapping where imagine if you will you have a source that is bright at a certain wavelength but where you want to do your science is a different wavelength. Um, in the example of a source that maybe is bright at two microns um, and, and another consideration here also is imagine if you will you have setups where um, Detectors work really well at a certain wavelength, but not so well at other wavelengths. You can actually leverage this to, to get around that as well. And so this is a good example of where you, know, you could potentially um, take your interferometer and track on light at say two microns. And then since the array is now phased up, if you've built it right with all reflective surfaces or careful consideration for everything else, it's now phased up for other wavelengths, say like the N band at 10 microns. You can actually then just sample that N-band light and have uh, very long integration times. If you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth's atmosphere basically is always cruel to all of us and makes it so that you know, after a second or so or even much, much smaller times, you know, actually typically more like a millisecond, um, things become misaligned. You can actually use the two micron light to track things out and then you can just stare at your 10 micron light. Um, one of the things I have not highlighted is, you know, we have these path lengths through the system to the back end that have to be kept equal, but above each telescope, there's a column of air, at least for a ground-based telescope, that is actually shifting in path length a lot. We're talking one to 10 microns of shift when you want it to be less than, say, 10 nanometers. And it's doing so on time scales of, say, one to 10 milliseconds. And so this is a very, very cruel set, state of affairs, but you can try and get around this at least somewhat by tracking this pistoning effect with these delay lines, um, tracking it out, and then you just stare on your science wavelength. And so we actually demonstrated this, uh, was one demonstration when I worked on Prima. Um, here's the fringe position with the MIDI instrument at uh, uh, the basically the n-band, roughly 10 microns. But then when we turned on fringe tracking and basically had MIDI no longer try and track for itself, but it just stared and the Prima fringe tracking unit, the fringe sensing unit actually locked onto it, the amount of jitter that you can see in this fringe position basically flattened out into a nice straight line 
Uh, and so this, again, is the signal from that same detector, but now we're getting fringe stabilization at two microns from the uh, FSU. We were able to show that the fringe tracking errors went down by an order of magnitude. And in fact, MIDI not having to track for itself anymore um, improved its sensitivity by a lot. Um, a, uh, an interesting variation on this that you can think about is if you have a source that has a center of, of uh, light that is in a much different spot based on wavelength, um, you can actually use that to see interesting science stuff. And so in a case where you have a hot Jupiter next to a host star, if say, for example, you track at two microns, but then you try to look at what the fringe position is at a longer wavelength, you can actually see that that shifts in delay space because of the center of light is basically weighted off to one side because you're actually getting light from the, the hot Jupiter as well as the host star. Uh, and this was actually suggested in the early 90s by Shao and Colovita as a way to detect hot Jupiters. Uh, in the early 90s, the idea was dismissed because everybody knew there was no such thing. And uh, a opportunity was missed, I guess. But uh, yeah, this is one of the fun things that you can do with uh, this, uh, this wavelength bootstrapping. Um, another idea that you can do, again, trying to account for the fact that uh, you're dealing with the Earth's atmosphere, is you can do uh, baseline and wavelength bootstrapping. Um, one of the things I showed earlier was how you can get to this case where the fringes are over-resolved, where if you're on such a long baseline, the amplitude of the fringes are very, very small, particularly if you're constrained to operating inside of an atmospheric coherence time. And so a trick that we're starting to develop more and more in the community is on short baselines from telescope to telescope, you can actually lock up your array. You can get your array uh, such that the path lengths are equal between uh, an individual unit here and another unit and so on and so forth. And if you do that, you actually, for free, get this long baseline from here to here locked up as well. You've got the path length condition set as well. And so at that point, you can then stare. You can then try and trip open your shutter and let it collect light uh, longer than an atmospheric coherence time and try and get to these signals that otherwise are very, very buried in the noise. And so this is something that is a baseline bootstrap, and then if you actually do it at different wavelengths, you can actually do baseline and wavelength bootstrapping. And so we've demonstrated a little bit of this out at the NPOI interferometer in terms of uh, just doing this with the baselines, uh, and we're trying to extend that with an ear infrared fringe tracker as well. So going a step further, each one of these steps, by the way, is increasingly hard <laughs> and increasingly crazy. Let's see, how am I doing for time anyway? Okay, perfect. So with nulling, one of the things that you can do is uh, I've shown very simply how you can take the light and you put it together, you get constructive and destructive nulls. But if you actually uh, are smart about that, th with a beam combiner, uh, if you think about it very simply, when you send light to opposite sides of a beam splitter that's been phased up, one side gets a constructive null, and the other side gets a destructive null. This is basic conservation of energy, actually. And so on the constructive side, you have constructive interference. You can see the peak right here at the zero. If you look closely at the zero, when we go to the destructive side, it's the opposite. So if we actually zoom in and look a little closer at this, here's the constructive side, and there's the destructive side. And the idea here is if you actually have multiple sources at the same time, you get one that's giving you potentially constructive interference at slightly different offset than the other one. And in fact, the true situation is that uh, these are not equal in brightness, but one is much, much less bright. And so as you move in delay space uh, away from a constructive to a destructive null, you want to set it up so that the other source is still giving you some sort of useful signal. Uh, and so a good example of these uh, uh, are the, the, the keck Miller experiment, also LBTI. Um, a variation on this was proposed by Bracewell and expanded on by uh, Angel and Wolf, where if you actually take four of these telescopes, you can go from something that has a nice null to even a nicer null. So one of the problems with this sort of setup here is that if your source 
is resolved. Do you actually have a host star that has some sort of spatial extent? You have something called null leakage, where the breadth of the, 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 the you, don't, you don't get uh, fully constructive or fully destructive interference. You start to actually squish this in, like we saw before with the resolved source. And the null leakage can then start to contaminate what you're seeing here, or at least you have to measure for it. And so uh, this double bracewell idea was four sources so that you actually put everything together in such a way that you get a much deeper null around the center, and that gives you more space to look at your planets around the host stars. And so some, vari some, some variations on Darwin and TPF have thought about this. Um, and there are other games you can play with how you ar array the telescopes to get the null just right so that you can see the planet. Uh, finally, uh, as far as my remarks go, the very hardest thing you can try to do with interferometry is astrometry. This is why SIM was a little crazy in that that was the first major flight mission we were trying back in the day. And yet it's also probably about the hardest thing that you can do with interferometry is actually trying to do astrometry, find out the positions of stars. Um, the allure here is that in principle, astrometry is very easy. Um, what we do is the same thing where if you have two sources that have some kind of extent, spatial extent between them, some kind of se angular separation between them, they trace slightly different paths through the interferometer. And so in delay space, you just move your delay lines around and look for the fringe peaks. You can measure the separation in delay space by moving these delay lines around. And since you're moving the delay lines around and you're measuring that motion with laser metrology and you're doing it down at nanometer accuracy or even better, that translates, you know, that very, very high precision measurement here directly translates into the angular separation between the stars. So in principle, very simple. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> in practice, it's very, very hard. Um, so where do you separate the beams? So there are two ways to do this. You can separate them at the telescope, actually, as I've drawn here. Um, actually, as I've drawn here, you, I've sent everything to the back end, but you actually could, uh, in principle, come up with separate beam paths to the back end. Um, but then the measurement here of the delay line doesn't necessarily reflect a one-to-one -one correspondence between star A and star B. Um, the baseline has to be known to insane levels of precision. Uh, on SIM, with its 10-ish meter baseline, or a little bit less as it was in its final incarnation, we're talking about, uh, I think, tens of picometers was what was needed. Um, the, if you're tracing slightly different paths through the optical system, that actually could correspond to slightly different baselines that the star needs when you're talking about these levels of precision. Um, and so this is very hard to do. Um, it was demonstrated on sky with PTI, um, with VLTI and Prima. Uh, Gravity is actually starting to make a pretty good run at this. Uh, Chara has an experiment, I believe it's called Armada, is that right? That uh, John and Gail are working on. Um, the situation of doing it where you separate the beams at the telescope before you get to the back end is starting to be demonstrated with gravity wide as well. Uh, this is actually using leftover hardware from Prima, at least initially. Uh, so that's very exciting to see that going. Um, there's actually another variation on that where you can go from star to star to star and um, just hop from, uh, hopscotch from star to star and not do a dual star measurement, uh, but you have to have everything tied down with lasers. Uh, that's actually what was demonstrated at NPOI about 10 years ago. Um, basically, there was lasers reflecting off the mirror, determining their positions to about a micron relative to bedrock. And this was done for all the telescopes. And then we also ran laser metrology through the entire optical system to monitor path lengths down at the nanometer level as well. And uh, uh, it worked, but uh, it was very limited in how well it worked. So astrometry is very, very hard. Um, one of the things I'll point out is that with at least this dual beam technology, this dual beam architecture, um, you get for free uh, a observing technique called phase referencing where basically you can use your dual feed to look at a bright source and use that to basically lock up the interferometer, make it so that you get nice fringes on the back end, and then steer slightly off axis to see things nearby your phase reference on the sky. And so if you can find a science case where there is an interesting faint thing 
next to a sufficiently bright referencing thing, you can actually do very interesting science. Um, VLTI gravity has shown that uh, in, uh, in spades as far as uh, looking at the very, very interesting science case of the galactic center. And there just happens, you know, nature was at least slightly kind to us and put a just bright enough phasing reference nearby the galactic center. It's one of these IRS stars that allows us to, uh, allows the, the VLTI to lock onto that region of the sky and then steer slightly off and do interesting observations of the galactic center. And uh, the, the, the important thing is that if you're not trying to do um, astrometry in the, in the formal sense, you can actually, uh, particularly in the imaging case, go to uh, much easier requirements because you have uh, some reduced tolerances on the baseline knowledge and other things. Um, on the ground, you have a significant problem in that what each telescope sees in terms of the column of air on the sky is limited to the isoplanatic angle, which uh, in the near infrared is on the order of about 10 seconds of arc on the sky. And so it, it has a bit of a constraining factor on how much you can apply this across the whole sky. Um, what's interesting is that in space, there is no such problem. And so you can actually use this technique. And if you have a field of view that allows you to go out to about a degree or two, you will always find something in the Bright Star catalog that can use, be used to phase up your array. And so you can actually do, um, you know, you know kind of 100 hertz or kilohertz rate tracking and updates if you have a dual feed like this and actually get a lot of system knowledge out of a bright star in the sky. And that's actually kind of nice. Uh, with that, I'm coming up on the back end of my remarks here. And I we can hand this over to, uh, I think, Gautam is next.